The 21st of January 1919 is a key date in Irish history. Two important things happened on that day. The first is that the first Irish Thal, the Irish Parliament, met on that day in the Mansion House at Dublin. Because the Sinn Féin Members of Parliament elected in 1918 had made it clear from the beginning that if elected, they would not take their seats at Westminster. They would abstain. And here they declared that Ireland was free, that Ireland was independent, and that they would meet as an independent Irish Parliament in Dublin. And at that first meeting, they passed a democratic programme of government and declared Irish independence. The second event was that the first shots were fired in the Irish War of Independence. Now, this wasn't done deliberately. This was just a coincidence that it happened on the same day as the meeting of the First Thal. Two members of the Royal Irish Constabulary, the RIC, were travelling with some gelignite where they were attacked by some volunteers and the volunteers shot the men and stole the gelignite. And Thomas Bartlett, the historian, has described this as the Irish Lexington, the first shots in the Irish War of Independence. Between January 1919 and the truce that was declared in the summer of 1921, there were a total of 1,400 people killed, 405 policemen, or IC members, 150 British soldiers, and the rest were Irish civilians and Irish soldiers. And it's sometimes hard to get an exact figure there because sometimes you had indiscriminate shootings by the British forces in Ireland. It's also interesting to look at what people call this struggle. To some it's the Irish War of Independence, to others it's the Anglo-Irish War, to others it's the Tan War, because the Black and Tans were some of the British reinforcements who were sent to Ireland at this time and who had a reputation for lawlessness and viciousness. And sometimes people call it the Tan War because they don't accept that it was Ireland's War of Independence, because it didn't lead directly to the creation of an Irish Republic. Partition occurred during this time, and they believe that until Ireland is a united country, well then Ireland is not truly independent. So you can very often tell someone's political leanings by what they call this conflict. Uh, during this time, Eamon de Valera was rescued from prison. He went off on a tour of the United States where he was greeted by 50,000 people at Fenway Park, the home of the Boston Red Sox, and he delivered a stirring oration. But although de Valera embarked on a fundraising campaign in the United States, the fact that he was out of Ireland for most of this period actually gave him a, a misguided sense of what was going on. When he came back from America, he turned to Collins and he said, this guerrilla warfare campaign that you're fighting, it's bad for us in terms of public relations. What you guys should do is you should line up about 500 of you and have an open fight with the British Army. And Collins just looked at him like he was crazy. The whole success of the Irish revolutionaries was that they weren't fighting by conventional means. They were fighting a guerrilla warfare campaign, ambushes, blocking off roads, catching uh, the British by surprise, not wearing military uniform so that you could drift off into the countryside. And as the British began to increase their attacks, they resorted to flying columns where the men would travel in groups of about 20 from house to house with friends and supporters putting them up and that that way they could drift meld into the countryside without being caught. So Collins was becoming a key figure in this campaign. De Valera, the spiritual leader of the movement on the political side, but he was away in the United States. And there were atrocities committed on both sides. Innocent people killed by both sides as mistakes were made. The terror though on the British side was worse because they were meant to represent the forces of law and order. 
and they could not control even their own troops and very often retaliated by opening fire into the crowd. They sent over these troops who I mentioned, the Black and Tans, so-called because there wasn't enough regulation military uniform, so they were given half police black, half army khaki, so it was a mixture of uniforms. Now, in popular memory, these were the vicious thugs. These were the, the, the troops who had been uh, 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 damaged by the First World War, suffering from post, what we would call post-traumatic stress. In the popular memory, they were criminals who were let out of prisons in England to go off and kill the Irish. But certainly, the introduction of the Black and Tans and then the Auxiliaries increased, escalated tensions in Ireland. And the British didn't really understand what was going on in Ireland at this time. Walter Long was the key British advisor on Irish affairs. He had been a former Chief Secretary, and his belief was that the Irish were trying to join the United States. They were trying to find an alliance with them, and that was what their mission was. So it's no wonder when the British was getting such incorrect and confusing advice that they were at a loss. Lloyd George, the British Prime Minister, the Welsh Wizard, he wanted to negotiate. The trouble was they could not negotiate from a position of weakness. So his strategy was to try and win the war and then negotiate with the rebels. But as the war dragged on and the atrocities mounted on the government side, the pressure mounted on him to find a solution. Especially because with all of the peacemaking after, after World War I, he was under pressure from the Americans and from others around the world to find a solution to the Irish problem. They were horrified by the stories that were going on. And as all of the stories of the Black and Tans were revealed, the pressure mounted on them. And I'll just mention three of the key icons from this period, because their stories inspired people around the world. These stories angered people, not just the Irish Americans, or the Irish Australians, but people of all nationalities who were offended at what they saw as just indiscriminate killing and, and uncontrollable violence. The first is the murder of Tomás McCurtain. Now he was a Sinn Féin politician, he was elected Lord Mayor of Cork, and troops broke into his house on the 19th of March 1920 and murdered him in his home. There was no provocation, there was no resistance, he was not armed. That was cold-blooded murder. That caused a public outcry. His successor was Terence McSweeney, and he replaced him as Lord Mayor of Cork. And he gave a speech where he said that, it is not those who can inflict the most, but those who can suffer the most who will triumph. Well, he was arrested uh, at one of the courts that the Sinn Féin party had set up. They were dismantling the British legal system by having their own courts. Well, he was presiding over one of these courts and it was raided by the police and he was arrested. And he decided to go on hunger strike to make a political point. And that's what he did. Now, when someone goes on hunger strike, they're usually only given a couple of weeks to live, maybe a month at most. But he lasted for over two months, and the British didn't know what was going on. Was someone smuggling in food to him? Was he breaking his, his own hunger strike? He himself put it down to divine intervention. God was keeping him alive during all of this. There was huge support for him for the 74 days that he was on hunger strike. Support from around the world, including Ho Chi Minh and, other, and others. It offended people in America to think that even George V, the British king, privately favoured mercy. But the British were afraid of being seen to back down. The London Times published an editorial on the 2nd of September 1920. And in it it said that if he dies, if Terence McSweeney dies, his name will rank with Emmett and Tone in the martyrology of Ireland. And that's exactly what happened. He died in Brixton Prison on the 25th of October, 1920, on the 74th day of his hunger strike. The third icon was a boy of 18, a boy called K. 
Kevin Barry. And he led a number of, he had been a student in Dublin, had, had dropped out of his studies because he, he was passionately inspired by the example of Pierce and the others, and he wanted to get involved in the struggle. He was involved in a number of military operations in 1920, but one in 1920 went horribly wrong and he was captured. And he was captured after three British soldiers who were roughly his same age, 18, 19, were killed. And funnily enough, there was no public sympathy for them that they were boys, they were young lads. Uh, no public support there. But Kevin Barry, this 18-year-old, huge public support for him. And he was put on trial, there was a court-martial, and he behaved defiantly. One reporter said he had a callous indifference to his fate, and he was prepared to die. And he was the first person to be tried and executed under the Restoration of Order in Ireland Act, and he was taken out in Mountjoy Prison and executed. And immediately ballads sprung up. And there's a very famous one, the Ballad of Kevin Barry, which has been performed by some of the greatest singers around the world. Paul Robeson has a brilliant version of it. And this, this song became one of the great inspirations of how just a lad of 18 summers had walked proudly to his death. Shoot me like an Irish soldier, do not hang me like a dog, for I fought to free old Ireland on that still September morn. Another martyr for old Ireland, another murder for the crown, whose brutal laws may kill the Irish but can't keep their spirit down. Lads like Barry will free Ireland, for her sake they'll live and die. And it's incredible the number of children who were called Kevin in Ireland in the months after his execution. And someone at the time noted that when people have to hang young boys like that, their cause is lost, their day is over. And that was very true. A few weeks after that, Michael Collins carried out his surgical strike on British intelligence in Dublin, in, in the event what that became known as Bloody Sunday, where his hit squad targeted alleged British agents and murdered them in their beds. Later that day, in retaliation, the Black and Tans went into Croke Park, that great football and hurling stadium where Gaelic sports are played, and they opened fire on the players on the pitch and on the crowd. They killed 11 people in the crowd and one Tipperary player, a man called Michael Hogan. And today the great stand in Croke Park is called the Hogan Stand in honour of him. Now, the British claimed that they had been fired upon, that someone in the crowd had opened fire on them, but few believed them. And that atrocity horrified, scandalised people in Britain and around the world. The idea that these lawless, awful troops would go into a, a peaceful sporting event and shoot at the players, shoot at the civilians in the crowd in retaliation for what had happened, that was seen as just too much. But there were also some atrocities on the rebel side and in recent years these have proven horribly contentious for Irish historians. The most heated debates in Irish historiography at the moment surround some of these atrocities. One of them took place at Kilmichael in County Cork where Tom Barry was the rebel commander and the story according to Barry was that they attacked a British convoy, they captured it, the British troops surrendered, and then as they were preparing to disarm the troops, the British tried to attack them. They went for their guns and tried to shoot them, and the Irish had to shoot them dead. It was a false surrender, it was a trick. But ever since then, stories have come out saying that there was no false surrender at Kilmichael, that the British did indeed surrender and then the Irish, blood crazed, opened fire anyway and massacred them where they stood with their hands up. And that controversy divides people. That controversy is seen by some as an insult to the memory of the brave Irish commanders, even though there's some evidence uh, on the rebel side, from the rebels' own accounts, that this is what happened. And certainly we learn a lot by exploring uh, cases like the Kilmichael ambush. 
The problem for the government is that they were afraid of imposing martial law all over the country and recognising that this was a war situation because that would be humiliating. They preferred to see this as a civil disobedience issue, civil disorder. Sending in the army would kind of be an acknowledgement that they were dealing with a different country. They were dealing with a different power and that would have been too much. But eventually, as the war dragged on, they realised they would have to negotiate and peace feelers were sent out. And de Valera, who was back in Ireland at this time, was arrested in the summer of 1921. But a few hours later, a phone call was made and he was released. And de Valera realised that this was a message. This was the British saying, we need to negotiate with de Valera. And so it came to pass. A truce was organised. British delegates were sent to London and they were sent with the mission of bringing back the Irish Republic.